When Virgin got the rights to publish original Doctor Who novels, they knew they needed to take things in a new direction. They needed a design philosophy that would keep adult Doctor Who fans interested, keep them hooked and buying. On the back of the early books in the series, the Virgin New Adventures referred to itself as full-length science fiction novels, stories too broad and too deep for the small screen. Of course, different authors had different ideas as to what this meant. Terence Dix took it to mean Doctor Who taking on very serious subject matters, in his case the rise of the Nazi party and just how corrupt our world can become. John Peel took it to mean injecting the franchise with a lot of raunchy sex and masculine violence, throwing Doctor Who into the realm of adult-oriented excess. Nigel Robinson took it to mean... absolutely nothing. When it came time to write the third book in the series, Robinson simply wrote a normal, middle-of-the-road, unexciting Doctor Who story. Well, dang, what am I supposed to do with that? This is Time Worm Apocalypse by Nigel Robinson. Okay, okay, stop me if you've heard this one. Okay, there's a society, all right? And it's like the most perfect society. Everybody's happy. Nobody wants for nothing. It's just perfect. However, this society has a deep, dark secret. There's somebody or something behind the curtains pulling the strings, and they have their own evil agenda. And things would have stayed that way if the doctor and his companion hadn't shown up. Can the Doctor uncover this secret conspiracy in time and free the society from their invisible shackles? Stay tuned! While Doctor Who has the capacity to tell virtually any kind of story it wants, there are certain types of stories it returns to over and over again. Some have even become unofficially recognized subgenres of the show, such as the Base Under Siege story, where the Doctor and a group of people have to defend themselves in a single location while being attacked from all directions. Base Under Siege were especially common in the Second Doctor era, but they never went away. Likewise, the whole Utopia Has Dark Secret plot, what TV Tropes calls the False Utopia, is also pretty common. It's an easy plot that you could write Mad Lib style if you felt so inclined. Just plug in a few names and what the ultimate goal of the bad guys are, and you don't really need to do anything else. That said, I do prefer this kind of plot to the previously mentioned Base Under Siege. Siege stories are about putting action set pieces first. They're about attacks on moon bases and the survivors piecing together makeshift weapons. That can certainly be exciting, but it can also be very flat and uninteresting if you don't inject additional elements into it. The False Utopia, on the other hand, is inherently political. I mean, all art is inherently political to an extent, but these kind of stories put their political foot in first. They're about how power can be abused and how people, the populace, need to be able to question authority and hold them accountable. What this power pulling the strings actually is, is up to the author. They can put in pretty much anything they hate as the villains. Twisted liberalism, or evil conservatism, or devious capitalism, or Kenny Rogers if you felt so inclined. Of course, you don't have to, you can just make the villains of your piece some kind of generic monster, but you're not going to scrub this scenario clean of its inherent political nature, so why not embrace it? I'm, I'm talking to you, Robinson. Why didn't you embrace it? Because Nigel Robinson's false utopia is probably among the safest and least thought-provoking ones I've experienced in a while. Here's the gist. Welcome to the planet Kirith, home of the Kirithans a race that is technically alien, but all look like gorgeous supermodels. They used to have had it bad. They were hunter-gatherer types in a harsh environment with nasty predators and disease and stuff. But then, the Pangistri landed on the planet. Despite being a completely separate race from another planet, the Pangistri are also just people. Just more technologically advanced. They saved the Carithans from their crappy way of life, feeding them, teaching them sciences, and all they ask for return is to live in solitude on the island of Kandasi. Nearly 4,000 years later, and the Carithans live in a beautiful city without a worry in the world. Except, of course, that's all a lie. It's a fake history made up by the Pagistri to keep the Carithans in line. God, these are words. The Carithans are actually a genetically engineered race, basically lab rats for the Pagistri to experiment on. To what ends, we'll get into later. In order to maintain control, the Carithans are fed something called Zavit, 
an all-purpose foodstuff, and a very specific form of mind control. It keeps them generally complicit and docile, but can also blat out very specific memories, somehow. Anytime the Pandistri remove a Carithan from their experiments, the Zavat removes the memory of that person from the populace. How? I haven't got a clue. I guess they changed the recipe? Alright guys, they need to forget Steve, so we need to add two more tablespoons of nutmeg. Oh, also, a Zavat is soylent green, because we need to make it just that much more evil. At a stretch, you could say that Nigel Robinson's big political evil here is maybe genetic engineering, the evils of science, but I'm not really sure that's the case. There really isn't much emphasis on evil genetic engineering, just that these assholes are doing evil stuff with it. In an interview he did with Doctor Who magazine, Robinson stated he had an interest in genetic engineering, but didn't clarify if he was interested in the science of it or if he was interested in the morality of it. It's hard to say when nothing the Pandistri do here resemble anything revolving real-life genetics. They basically make a bunch of mutant monsters. They have more in common with your average Power Rangers villain than they do the guys who made Dolly the Sheep. No, there's really not much to these villains, which is okay, that's fine, not everything needs to be complex, unless you're advertising complexity on the back of the book. Andrew Carmel had a pink-haired Margaret Thatcher analog, and that was actually on television. Dressing up a world leader like a clown really isn't that high of a bar to jump. Okay, l let me back off for a little bit, because coming up with the Virgin New Adventures mission statement was not Robinson's job. None of the authors probably even knew about the broad and deep descriptors at the time. All they knew is that they were allowed to push Doctor Who into PG-13 territory if they wanted to. And even that, Robinson opted out of. Nigel Robinson was born, when I don't know, but he was definitely born, and grew up in a place, somewhere in England, you know. With a backstory like that, he might as well be Kaiser Soze. Now, Robinson's story begins after he graduated university in the early 1980s. Now, early 80s, the world got hit with a pretty bad recession. The United States got out of it relatively alright, but it hit England really hard, with unemployment reaching 3 million by 1982. Suffice it to say, Robinson couldn't find a job, and ended up having a lot of free time to spend at the pub. One of his frequent drinking buddies was a girl he knew from school named Linda Wilson, and they both happened to be major dorks. While most people would get pissed at a pub and argue over sports teams, Robinson and Wilson fought over Tolkien. The two of them were huge Lord of the Rings geeks, and would try to one-up each other with obscure Tolkien trivia. Then, one day, one of them got the bright idea to write all this trivia down, and before they knew it, they had written a Tolkien quiz book. They shopped it around, and the book was picked up by W.H. Allen, who, if you remember, owned Target Books at that point. So, the unemployed Robinson had an in with W.H. Allen, and W.H. Allen were in charge of the Doctor Who books, so Robinson went, uh, you know guys, the Tolkien quiz book was fairly successful. We could maybe do Doctor Who quiz books? And do quiz books he did. He did three, in fact. The first in 1981, the second in 1982, and the third in 1985. Oh, and also in 1982, a Doctor Who crossword book, because why not? Linda Wilson was out at this point, she didn't care for Doctor Who, and so she went out and did other books, maybe? There's something like four or five Linda Wilsons on the literary world, and I have no clue which of them are her, if any of them. Of course, quiz books aren't exactly literature, so after a few undocumented years, Robinson finally became part of the novelization team, writing his first novelization of the first Doctor's story, The Sense Rights, in 1987. He would end up writing four novelizations and eventually became the official editor of Target Books. That's quite the promotion if you ask me, though it proved to be quite overwhelming. During my time at Target Books, there was never enough time to do as much editing as I would have liked. I was responsible not just for the Who books, but also for the children's list, the non-fiction list, and a sizable portion of the adult fiction titles. This was despite my protest to the then managing director that Who was essentially a full-time job. In fact, the sales of Who books, along with W.H. Allen's softish porn anonymous range, formed the bedrock of the company. We were literally on a treadmill, publishing one novelization a month, and if I had my way, the novelizations would have been much longer. 
There are also a couple I wouldn't have allowed to have been published in the state they were. I won't mention any titles, but you may be able to guess which ones they are. Because I was something of an expert on Doctor Who, after having written the quiz books, I spent a lot of time correcting continuity references. People like Terence Dix know the show backwards, of course, but first-time writers often need a little bit of guidance. Uh, to name a few, Vic Pemberton had a TARDIS landing on a cliff in his original manuscript of Fury from the Deep, until I point out that it actually materialized on the sea. Glenn Jones, in his sample chapters, which I asked every new writer submit, called the character of Vicky Tanny, her name in the original scripts, and Peter Ling swore blind for weeks that Zoe had long blonde hair, until I sent him a video of the mind robber. To apologize, he took me out for lunch. A very nice man indeed. And of course, just about every writer from the Hartnell area called You Know Who, Doctor Who. Robinson didn't hold on to the position long, at most a year before Peter Darvel Evans replaced him. And that was it for a few years until the Virgin New Adventures started kicking into gear and Robinson was asked to come on board for as one of its first writers. Darvel Evans was interested in a book that took place in the far future, near the end of the lifespan of the universe, to mirror time worm genesis taking place at the dawn of human civilization. That's a nice idea, but since the writers never really talked to each other, nothing really came of it. Time Worm Apocalypse marked Robinson's first original work, and the first writer to really be able to say that. Even John Peel wrote Doctor Who fan fiction before doing it professionally. If Robinson ever did any, it's not on record. So how did he feel about writing for the Seventh Doctor and Ace? I think Ace is a delight to write for. She's a very easy character to write about, with her streetwise attitudes. I suspect writing for Ace is like what it must be for writing for Tegan, very enjoyable. Sylvester McCoy's Doctor is far more difficult, and I tried to go for the darker sides of him, but I think it's a tribute to the two actors that it has been such good fun writing with their characters in mind. So for those keeping score, John Peel actively hated the Seventh Doctor and made him a horrible asshole as a result, Terence Dix was a bit undereducated on the Seventh Doctor and so opted to default to the Core Doctor, and Nigel Robinson had trouble writing for the character, but gave it an honest try. And it was an honest try. The Seventh Doctor doesn't really do much in this book besides make a few suggestions to other characters and one big action moment in the finale, and that's fine. It'd hardly be the first time the Doctor stuck in the margins of the story and saved the day through gentle persuasion. Except that the book insists that the Doctor is the reason this is all happening. You may have noticed I have not brought up the Time Worm yet. She is barely in this book, even less so than the last one where she spent the entire time stuck in Hitler's brain. Yes, the Time Worm is technically the reason all of this is happening, but she's very much a tacked on afterthought. So when the Doctor extracted her from Hitler's brain in the last book, she decided to hide away in the TARDIS. Except not the Seventh Doctor's TARDIS, but the Second Doctor's TARDIS. We get a few passages from the point of view of the Second Doctor, still pretty fresh from his regeneration in the Tenth Planet, and his mind space isn't entirely 100% yet. He lands on Kirith, thousands of years before the events we're currently dealing with, and the Pandistri are living in huts and having a hard time with things. While Robinson might have had trouble with his first outing with the Seventh Doctor, he genuinely has a knack for writing the Second Doctor, and these are probably the best sections in the book. Are you lost, sir? He looked down at the small, red-headed girl tugging at his dirty frock coat. She was carrying a battered doll under one arm, and the dirty streaks around her eyes told him that she had recently been crying. There was a look of concern on her face. Am I lost? He repeated, and rubbed his chin thoughtfully, considering the question as he might do a complicated equation. Well, I don't think so. Not this time, anyway. He crouched down beside the girl and gave her his most charming smile. She grinned back. But I think my friend might be lost, he said. Have you seen her? The tall lady with the blonde hair, the girl offered. Yes, that's her, nodded the little man. Her name's Polly. Do you know where she is? She's over by the marketplace, she replied, and indicated the way. The scruffy little man thanked the girl, but as he stood up to go, she tugged at his sleeve. Sir, she ventured and offered him her doll. He sat down cross-legged on the floor and examined the broken toy. Everything gets old and falls apart in time, he said philosophically. It even happens to me. The child's face fell until he added, But most things can be fixed. Let's see what I can do. 
The side of the rag doll had been ripped open and its stuffing was beginning to fall out. One eye was loose and connected to the smiling face by only a single thread. The little man emptied one of his pockets, coming across a pair of conkers, a yo-yo, a bag of last marbles, and an old banana skin before he found the needle and thread he was looking for. With the expert hand of a tailor, he set about stitching the doll together again. His task finished, he handed the doll back to the little girl, who inspected it closely and then smiled. Thank you, sir, she said, and then as an afterthought, I like you. You're nice. His jade green eyes twinkled with delight. And I like you too. That scene really sums up the doctor pretty wonderfully. He'll be stopping fleets of genocidal war machines on Tuesday. He'll be fixing a little girl's doll on Wednesday, and both with the same passion and care. However, this is later reframed as a bad thing, I guess, because the time worm ends up stowing away on the second doctor and then hopping into the brain of this little girl. This little girl would later grow up to be the Grand Matriarch, the woman in charge of this entire operation. The doctor blames himself for this, but I'd hardly call it his fault. The time worm didn't force him to do anything. It just piggybacked on him without his knowledge. That's pretty silly, but it's also kind of necessary. Because here's the ultimate goal of the Pengistry. The universe is near its end. Soon everything will implode on itself. What scientific theorists call the Big Crunch. The Pandistry want to stop it. And to do that, they're building a god machine. How does it work? We culled the best of the Crithans, the wisest, the most talented. Over nearly a thousand years, we have distilled the best of the best into a vast machine, a biomechanism which, when completed, will become an independent life form, the only force capable of halting and reversing the destruction of the universe. But what sort of machine could do that? asked Raphael. A life form that has reached the Omega Point, the doctor said darkly. An entity that has been everywhere, experienced every emotion, done everything, and knows all there is to have been known. An omnipotent and omniscient being. Okay, clearly this isn't even an attempt at even fake science. This is straight up alchemy. Who knew that in order to become a god, all I had to do was experience everything? So when Johnny Cash said he'd been everywhere, man, he was announcing his divinity? I mean, it makes sense. This is Johnny Cash we're talking about. Now, in reality, the Time Worm is having the Grand Matriarch make this thing to increase her own power, which is kind of whatever, but I prefer it as an alternative. Remember what the Second Doctor told the little girl? That everything gets old and falls apart with time, but most things can be fixed? Without the tacked on Time Worm influence, the implication is that the little girl took the Doctor's words to heart so much that she decided to fix the entire universe by turning evil and subjecting helpless lab rats to horrible experiments. I don't know about you, but I'm not really on board with the idea that small acts of kindness can have dire consequences, because the only answer to that is to stop being kind. Now before we wrap things up, we need to talk about two more things, Raphael and Penda's Fen. Raphael is one of the Carithans, a young lad who becomes the focal point when he starts to remember people from his past, people the Zavit should have wiped from his memory entirely. Now Raphael's role in the story is to be luggage. He's a tag-along as the Doctor and mostly Ace actually do most of the real work. He starts learning things from Ace, including how to use some of her explosives, but he's not cut out for all the violence that starts breaking out. His big moment comes at the end, when he discovers the God Machine and decides, yeah, I'll get into that. He gets absorbed into it, takes control of it, rips the Time Worm out of the Great Matriarch, and punts her into the horizon like she's Team Rocket. And then he goes off to do god stuff, I guess. That's what the book does with the character, but I don't think that's what the book tries to do with the character. The book opens with a couple of quotes, and one of them is from something called Penda's Fen. Penda's Fen is a British television play from 1974. Written by David Rudkin and directed by Alan Clark, the play revolves around a young man named Stephen growing up in the tiny village of Pinvin. Stephen is a lot of things. A fundamentalist Christian, a staunch patriot, and a total sourpuss. Things change when a socialist playwright comes into town and starts talking alternative liberal politics. This starts Stephen on a journey of discovering that life is a lot more complicated than he realized. He begins questioning his religion, his politics, his attitude, and even his sexuality, and this questioning manifests itself as visions of other beings, of angels and demons and long-dead artists. 
It goes full magical realism by the halfway point, and ends with Stephen meeting the spirit of King Penda, the last pagan king of Britain. The quote Robinson uses comes from that exchange. Night is falling. Your land and mine goes down into a darkness now. And I and all the other guardians of her flame are driven from our home up out into the wolf's jaw. But the flame still flickers in the fen. You are marked down to cherish that. Cherish the flame till we can safely wake again. The flame is in your hands, we trusted you. Our sacred demon of ungovernableness. Cherish the flame, we shall rest easy. Stephen, be secret. Child, be strange. Dark true, impure, and dissonant. Cherish our flame. Our dawn shall come. So, considering Penda's Fend as a literary reference, it's not hard to see Raphael as Robinson's version of Stephen. You have a younger man devoted to a society that worships higher powers, then an older man comes from the outside world, the young man starts to have visions of people who are not there and is forced to question his reality and his devotion to that reality. He sees many wonderful, terrible things, accepts a more complex worldview, and then takes up a great power to uphold this worldview. King Penda gives Stephen the flame of paganism, Raphael is given the god machine. I think this comparison really opens this book up, really helps in understanding the intentions and goals of the book, but it also frames Nigel Robinson as the honest try author. Much in the same way he knew that the Seventh Doctor was the Dark Doctor, but couldn't quite figure out the hows and whys for this characterization, he knows the basic ideas of Pendus Fen without understanding how those ideas were communicated. If your story is about someone losing their faith, you first have to show them with faith. We spend almost 20 minutes learning how Stephen is devoted to his ideals, but Raphael is already struggling when he's introduced. His memories are already returning. There's no contrast. You also need to show what these characters have faith in, and the Corinthians have virtually no culture to speak of. They have no art, seemingly no leisure activities, no mantras. They don't do anything but walk around and be gorgeous. If Nigel Robinson wanted to make this the Doctor Who version of Pendus Fen, he certainly didn't know how. I realize I'm coming off as super harsh here, so let me come around and say that this is not a bad book. It's just kind of mediocre, and I'm hardly the first to say that. Many have called this a target novelization for a story that never aired on TV, and that seems apt. It doesn't take advantage of the literary form, either in terms of style, of which there is none to speak of, or scope. The only thing in this book that couldn't have been done on a BBC television budget is this giant sea monster you see on the cover, but its only purpose in the story is to kill off a minor character. You could easily cut this monster out of the story and kill that character somewhere else. It is a, a safe book with safe tropes. It doesn't have the problematic elements you saw in the last two books. There's nothing offensive about it. It's just wholly disposable as a story. And I mean that in the best possible way. At only 201 pages, it's a quick read. It has so little to do with the Time Worm arc that people who just pick it up on their own probably won't be all that much confused. It's a popcorn book, something that offers very little in substance, but you can still snack on it if you're craving some airy science fiction. It's only when you try to get under the hood that you start to realize its wasted potential. But there's good news. It would seem that Nigel Robinson learned a lot from this experience. Not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but Robinson's next book, Birthright, is a vast improvement over this, and I can't wait to get to it. Next time, the Doctor and the Time Worm prepare for their final battle on the moon! Thank you.